Chapter the Eighth of the Manchester Man by Mrs. G. Linnaeus Banks. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blue Coat School. The children of the poor began early to earn their bread. Legislature has stepped in to regulate the age and hours for labour in manufacturing districts and to provide education for the humblest. Jabez Clegg was not born in these blissful times and he only narrowly escaped the common lot. He was not eight years old, yet Simon, on whom war prices pressed as heavily as on his neighbours, began to discuss with Bess the necessity for sending the lad to Simpson's factory, where Arkwright's machinery was first set in motion. "'A mun go as soon as the new year tax a fair grip,' decided Simon, and 1805 was at its last gasp as he said it but the new year brought Jabez a reprieve by the uncourtly hands of Joshua Brooks. Meeting Simon and Jabez at a stall in the apple market, where, the better to bargain, he had laid down a pile of old classical school books. Joshua was a collector of these, which he retailed again to the boys at prices varying with his mood, or his estimate of the purchaser's pocket. He accosted the former. "'Well, old Leathershanks,' What are you going to make of young cheat the fishes there? I suppose he's to follow your own trade. He began to tan hides so early. And the glance which shot from under his shaggy brows caused the boy to blush and shrink behind his protector. Simon's eyes twinkled, but he shook his head as he answered, Nay, Parson Brooks, when thou to sending him to the cotton factory. But it fair goes again th grain to send th little chap through the streets to wark winter and summer, wheat or dry, a fourth sun's up and about his wark. But we gonna keep him bout it. Times are so bad. Hm, mm, then what a stupid old leatherhead you must be not to think of the college, where he'd be kept and fed and clothed and educated. Educated, man, do you hear? Simon heard and his eyes again twinkled and winked at the new idea presented to him. Apprenticed, he echoed, with a long-drawn, gasping breath. Aye, and apprenticed. Parson, cramming his pockets with apples, for which he had higgled with much persistence, handed one to Jabez with the question, How would you like to be a college boy, Jabez, and wear a long blue coat like that fellow yonder? pointing to a boy then crossing the market on an errand, and learn to write and cipher as well as to read. If you please, n or like it more nor out. His animated face was a clearer answer than his words. Joshua then read the lad a brief homily to the effect that only good and honourable boys could find admission, winding up with, If you're a very good lad, I'll see what can be done for you. He interrupted thanks with, Easter's very near, Sim, so you'll have to stir your stumps to prove that our honourable young friend came honourably into the world. I'll get the forms and fill them up for you, and his baptismal register too. He snatched up his books and was off, the tassel of his collegiate cap and the cassock he wore flying loose as he hurried away, muttering to himself, What an old fool I am to bother about the lad! I dare say he'll turn round and sting me in the end like the rest of the snakes I've warmed. As great an idiot as old Dame Clues. Chetham's College or Hospital is a long, low, ancient stone edifice, built on the rock above the mouth of the Irk, with two arms of unequal length stretching towards church and town, and embracing a large quadrangle used as a playground, which has for its fourth and southern boundary a good useful garden. It is needless to grope upward from the time when the Saxon thane built a fortified residence on its site. Sufficient for us that Thomas de la War, youngest son of the feudal baron of Manchester, was brought up to the church, and in the fourteenth century inducted into the rectory of Manchester. His father being patron, his elder brother dying at the close of the century, the rector, a pious churchman, became baron, and then he put his power and wealth to sacerdotal uses. He petitioned the king, obtained a grant to collegiate Christ Church, erected the college, endowed it with lands, and here at his death 
the warden of the collegiate church had his residence. Of these wardens, the celebrated Dr. D., whose explorations into alchemy and other occult sciences brought him into trouble with Queen Elizabeth, was one, and Dr. D.'s room is still extant, in occupation of the governor. In 1580, at Crumpsall Hall, Humphrey Chetham was born, and he, a prosperous dealer in fustians, never marrying, at his own expense fed and clothed a number of poor boys, and by his will not only bequeathed a large sum of money to be expended in the foundation and endowment of a hospital for the maintenance, education and apprenticing of forty poor boys for ever, but one thousand pounds to be expended in a library, free to the public, the first free library in Britain. The estate was vested in fee-fees, and with them lay the power alike to elect boys and officials, from the townships of Manchester, Droylston, Crumpsall, Boltonley Moors and Turton. The boys were to be elected between the ages of six and ten, and were required to be of honest, industrious parents, and neither illegitimate nor deceased, and baptismal registers had to be produced. They had to be well maintained, well trained, and carefully apprenticed at fourteen, a fee of four pounds, a large sum in Humphrey Chetham's time, being given with them. The church wardens and overseers were to prepare lists of boys, doubling the number of vacancies, stating their respective claims, which lists they had to sign. Easter Monday was the period for election, after which the fee-fees dined together in Dr. D.'s quaintly carved room. Joshua Brooks was as good as his word. He procured a blank form from the governor, and, Simon being no great scholar, filled it in for him. He found him the baptismal register without charging the regulation shilling, got the name of Jabez inserted in the church warden's list, and such influence as he had with fee fees he exerted to the utmost, for the case was one involving doubt and difficulty. Nor had Simon Clegg been idle. He and his crony Matthew scoured Smedley and Crumpsall, and more successful than in their quest for Tom Hume, discovered the nurse who presided at the birth of Jabez. Her testimony, so far as it went, was important. He had interested both Mr. and Mrs. Clough in the election of the foundling, and where the influence of the gentleman failed, that of the lady prevailed, so that when the important Easter Monday arrived, two-thirds of the fee-fees were fully acquainted with his peculiar case, and more or less impressed in his favour. It was on the 18th of April, bright, sunny, joyous, Compared with its present proportions, Manchester then was but as a cameo brooch on a mantle of green, and that green was already starred with daisies, buttercups, primroses, and cowslips. By wells and brooks, daffodil and jonquil hung their heads and breathed out perfume. Bush and tree put out pale buds and fans of promise. The titlark sang, the cuckoo, to use a village phrase, had eaten up the mud, and the town was alive with holiday-makers from all the country round about. It was the great college anniversary, not only election day, but one set apart for friends to visit blue-coat boys, already on the foundation, and for the curious public to inspect the Chetham Museum. The main entrance in Millgate, said to be arched with the jawbone of a whale, and the smaller gate on Hunt's Bank were both thrown open. A stream of people of all grades in festival array poured in and out, and college cap and gown seemed to be ubiquitous. The pale sad widow or widower holding an orphan boy by the trembling hand, the uncle or next of kin to the doubly orphaned candidate, were there standing in a long line ranged against the building, and representing hopes and fears and eventualities little heeded by the shifting stream of gazers. For the previous week, Mrs. Clues and her assistants had been working night and day. Her shop was in a state of siege. Every boy and every boy's friend seemed to have pocket money to spend and to want to spend it over her counter. Then it was the great wedding day of the year, and the churchyard swarmed like a hive. From every one of the many public houses round college and church, music and mirth, clattering feet and loud-voiced laughter issued. The apple tree, the pack horse, the ringer bells, 
the blackamoor's head were filled to repletion with wedding guests whilst the college inn and the old sun inn held a less boisterous quota of the collegians friends and relatives on those wet days when outdoor play was impossible the boys besides darning their stockings occupied their spare hours in carving spoons and apple scrapers out of bone in working balls and pincushions in fanciful devices with coloured worsted and a stitch locally known as colleging and with these on easter monday and at whitsunside they reaped a harvest of pocket money having liberty to offer them for sale and when it is remembered that our notable female ancestors poor and rich wore indoors a pincushion and sheathed scissors suspended at their sides it is not to be wondered that these found ready purchasers as memorials of the visit but in that college yard were anxious and expectant as well as buoyant faces and there in that line waiting to be called when their turn came stood jabez between simon clegg and bess with matthew and the nurse on either hand and ever and anon their eyes went up to the oriel window which faced the main entrance for in the room it lighted the arbiters of the boy's destiny sat in judgment on some other orphan's claim at length the summons came for jabez clegg with palpitating hearts for anybody of men with irresponsible powers is an awful tribunal they passed under the arched portal at the western angle of the building following their guide past the doors of the great kitchen on the right hand and the boys refectory and dr d s room on the left up the wide stone staircase with its massive carved oak balusters along the gallery at once library and museum where gaping holiday folk followed a blue coat cicerone past shelves and glass cases and compartments separated for readers quiet study by carven bookshelf screens hearing but heeding little of the parrot roll the boys checked off here's oliver crummy's sword there's a lodestone there's a hairy mon there's the skeleton of a mon and so forth but following their own guide to the nail-studded oaken door of the fifi's room that door which might open to hope only to close on disappointment the fifi's room now the reading-room of the library deserves more than a passing notice it is a large square antique chamber with a deeply recessed oriel window opposite the door containing a table and seats for readers there are carved oak buffets of ancient date, ponderous chairs, and still more ponderous tables, one of which is said to contain as many pieces as there are days in the year. Dingy-looking portraits of eminent Lancashire divines stare at you from the walls, but the left-hand wall contains alone the benevolent presentiment of Humphrey Chetham, the large-hearted, clear-headed founder. Its place is over the wide chimney-piece, which holds an ample grate, and on either hand it is flanked by the carved effigy of a bird, the one a pelican feeding its young brood with its own blood, the other a cock, which is said, and truly, to crow when it smells roast beef. But we smell the Fifi's dinner, and must not delay the progress of Jabez and his friends. A large body of Fifi's were present, mainly in the uniforms of their special volunteer regiments. So this is the little fellow who was picked up asleep in a cradle during the flood of August 1799, observed rather than inquired one of the gentlemen who appeared as spokesman. You're your honours, answered Simon, making a sort of bow. Who can bear witness to that? An Orcon, responded Simon and Matt Cooper in a breath. It was us as got him out of the waiter. Anyone else? Bess stepped forward modestly. He were put in my arms on Tanner's Bridge, and I've brought him oop ever sin. Have you never sought for his parents? Aye, many a time. Matt and me have spent money a day seeking em, said Simon promptly, and we could fan no more than that papa tells, referring to a sheet in the questioning Fifi's hand. Then how do you date the boy's age with such precision? The nurse now sidled confidently to the front. If it please your honour's worship, o oh, were called to stiff back Nan's doubter in the last pinch, when who were loit to die, and that little chap were born afore or left. That were a fifth o' May, seventeen hundred and ninety nine. Oh, know it, for I broke me arm th' very next day. 
and the mother died? Yea, afore the week were out. And you think she was lawfully married? Where was her husband? Aye, that's it. Who had a guinea gold wedding ring on? And owd Nan said it were a sad thing the lass had ever got wedded, and wore the same sort. And all geet out o' her that they'd been wedded at Crumpsall. North neighbours knew as husband had had a letter to fetch him to Liverpool, and had never come back. Onybody is smedley knows that. And you think they were honest, industrious people? Aye, that they were, but ray the stiffeth joints, you know. Seem to think the cell's too good to talk to folk like, and maybe we'd a known th lad's name, and o' belonging to him. The old nobody nowt, and o' were paid for more job. Jabez was called forward and examined, and he came pretty well out of the fire. They found that he could read a little, knew part of his catechism, and they saw that he was a well-behaved, intelligent boy, with truthful dark grey eyes and a reflective brow. There was a long and animated discussion, during which the boy and his friends were bidden to retire. It was contended that the marriage of the boy's parents was not proven, that his very name was dubious, and that the founder's will was specific on that head. Then one of Mrs. Clough's friends rose and grew eloquent. He asked if they were to interpret the will of the great and benevolent man whose portrait looked down upon them by the spirit or by the letter, if they themselves did not feel that the boy was eligible, as the nurse's testimony went to prove, that this was a case peculiarly marked out for their charitable construction, and he wound up by inquiring if they thought Humphrey Chetham would expect his representatives to be less humane, less charitable, less conscientious in his dealing with a bounty not their own, than that poor struggling, hard-working tanner and his daughter, who had maintained and cherished the orphan, in spite of cruelly hard times, and still more cruel slander. And then he told, as an episode, what Sally Cooper had confessed, and how and why Bess had lost her lover. This turned the quivering scale. Jabez Clegg and his friends were called in. The verdict which changed the current of his life was pronounced. Jabez Clegg was a blue-coat boy. Before the night was out, while the floodgates of all their hearts were open, Matthew Cooper, though nearly twenty years her senior, asked Bess to be his wife. End of chapter the eighth.